Good evening. I'm Ron Burgundy, and this is what's happening in your world tonight. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and you don't have any debt, do you? I know I sure don't, especially since last month, whenever I bought all those lavish gifts, I always clicked on that handy little make four payments button. Okay, I'll fess up. One of those gifts was for me. I mean, who doesn't need a bedazzled free Britney crop top? Well, if you're getting credit card bills you can barely look at, fear not. Because today, we say hello to the author of the hit podcast and new bestseller, Get the Hell Out of Debt, Aaron Sky Kelly. For the lifeline, we'll look at something called infinity banking. What's that all about? Plus, we'll dive into a headline from today's news, and I'll share some mind-bending trivia. And now, two guys who have gotten the hell out of debt and are ready to help you do it, too. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. It's Debtless Wednesday. Welcome to 2021. I am Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. You know, you have Meatless Monday, Taco Tuesday, Debt-Free Wednesday. I like it. Yes. It could be a theme. We could have a theme for a while. Oh, well, the theme for this week, we're meet Sadie on Monday. Let's get it moving. And now today, Aaron Sky Kelly getting you out of debt. Not only, by the way, does Aaron have the definitive book on getting the hell out of debt, which is why it's titled that. You know what she does in her other life? She helps Tony Robbins organize his live events across the world. Oh, very cool. Yes. So Aaron Sky Kelly, one of my favorite people upstairs talking to mom right now. We got some headlines, but first, well, stackers, I'm diving into masterclass again, going back into Judd Apatow's masterclass. And I love what he says about, uh, and I hate the word authenticity, but it really is about having a conversation with your audience that has something to say and then also shows the humor and especially in awkward situations can show the humor. And isn't that really with the intersection of money and humor? There's so many awkward situations around money. And if you can tackle those with some humor, uh, I think Judd Apatow there is right on. But if you're not familiar with Masterclass and what they do, where I'm learning with Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere at your own pace. You can learn how to comedy from people, not just like Judd Apatow, but also Steve Martin. You can improve your cooking skills with a range of phenomenal chefs, including, of course, Gordon Ramsay. And you can learn about communication from Robin Roberts, learn about negotiation from Chris Voss, and so many other courses. With over 100 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do, it's closer than you think. I uh, finished this fall, and if you're new to the show, you won't know this, a great one by Bob Iger, which was fantastic about uh, his experience running the Disney Corporation and some of the lessons that he learned. And what a, what a great class that was as well. So I highly recommend you check it out, get unlimited access to every master class. And as a stacker, you're going to get 15% off an annual membership. So go to masterclass.com slash stacker now That's masterclass.com slash stacker for 15% off masterclass. All right, man, I'm all business today, aren't I? Like what's going on here? President business. Speaking of president business, when was the last time you watched the Lego movie? The first one? Yeah, that's the only one that. Yeah, the brilliant one. one. Just brilliant. Uh, It's been a long time. I think we should watch. We should watch the Lego movie. After this? Well, we got a podcast to record and uh, we probably have some. President business, business, business. (laughs) I know I get where you're going for that. I, I, now you got it. Okay. I totally missed it. The synapse is not firing. Apparently, I need more coffee. Uh, but we have got Aaron Sky Kelly. So let's get this headline out of the way, OG. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Today's headline comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. This is written by James McIntosh. 
who runs the Streetwise column at uh, the Wall Street Journal. I love this way he's, uh, well, in the case of this piece, he's finishing 2021, but it's really a great way to start 2022 as well. Tesla and my other investing mistakes of 2021, he writes. Streetwise started the year with a prescient, 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 prescient. Skip it. Streetwise started the year with a forecast. I feel, I feel like Porky Pig. Uh, there is plenty of scope to be horribly wrong about predictions of speculative excess. As 2021 draws to a close, it's a good time for investors to look back at the decisions they made over the year and why they made them with the hope of learning from their mistakes. And he talks about Tesla on a couple of occasions. Number one, he recommended that people sell Tesla at the beginning of last year. Of course, that did not work out well, even though initially, oh, gee, that was a good decision. You know, Tesla did go down and then it went screaming back up. And Elon Musk even said, hey, my company's overvalued. And of course, the company stock came back down after that. And when you're dealing with technical analysis like James's, when technical analysis works, it works over the short term, but it doesn't work over the long term. Like you can't make a move based on the short term data and try to parlay that into the right long term move. Because both times with Tesla, he was right over the short term and wrong over the over the long term. Well, and that just goes to show like how difficult it is to be correct on both ends of the spectrum, right? Like when he said, hey, I think you should sell Tesla at the beginning of 2021, he looked like a genius, right? And then it goes up double from that spot and it looks like an idiot. You have to be aware or recognize, especially, you know, you see people who advertise their stock picking prowess and like, hey, I recommended that we buy this and I recommended that we sell that. It's like, okay, so... That might have worked out, but what was the other cost around that? I recommended that we sell Tesla at 700 and it went to 500. Good job. Asterisk. Pay no attention to the stock going from 500 back to 1100. Back to, yeah, back over <laughs> you know. a thousand. Yeah. Uh, he also said that he was wrong when it came to bonds. He said, despite the visible froth in fashionable parts of the market, I stuck with stocks all year on the principle that the economy was recovering and the main alternative bonds was so unappealing. But while the stock market turned out to be a great place to be, I was entirely wrong about bonds from the end of March onward as they repeatedly refused to follow the macroeconomic playbook. Because of the strong link between long dated bond yields and the relative performance of growth stocks, this also meant I was wrong footed in my expectation that cheap value stocks would do better. You know, I don't know that we need to get into bonds. He also talks about inflation and about mm -hmm. how he was right on inflation. He was early, but he was right. So I don't, we don't need to go into the specifics of what he did, but I think the start of the year, you know, you and I all year long, we talk about don't get into the hype of emotionally making moves in your portfolio. I think the start of the year though, OG is a great time like James is doing and saying, listen, I'm not going to worry about Tesla. I'm not going to worry about bonds. I'm going to worry about my goals and my strategy to reach my goals and what's called my investment policy statement. And now I'm going to tweak the machine so that next year the machine runs a little more efficiently than it did the year before. I think this is a great time to do that. I was just watching a video uh, last night on YouTube, and it was a 10, 15 minute video about a manufacturing process for a product and how they have all these different stages. And, and you know, 10 years ago, they had this building and they produced 300 units. And now they have the same building and they produce 600 units and how they didn't add more square footage. They they just got better process. And they're interviewing all the people who kind of run the shop. And the, the head person's like, yeah, yeah, I mean, he was using manufacturing terms that I didn't understand. But but effectively, he was saying, every two years, we strip this thing down and start again, because we have new information, we have new process, we have new systems, we have new people. And so we strip it all down back to nothing and go, all right, let's build it again. And he said, and that takes us a week to, to basically gut the building, reorganize it into a better flow with the new information that we have. And boom, now we're able to process 10 or 15% more material than we were you know, two years prior, because we're, we can't add more space. We don't have a bigger building. I think that's a really good corollary to what you're talking about here in terms of every year you get more information. That doesn't mean you need to retool your investment policy statement and say, well, I was 80% stock. Now I need to be 20. Like right. that's not, not that. 
But you do have to take into account your goals. Assuming that your goals haven't changed, then your portfolio wouldn't change. But your portfolio has changed over the last 12 months. You know, your the exposure to different areas of the economy have changed. If you've done the set it and forget it plan, which is perfectly fine, by the way, it's not the same as you set it up a year ago or two years ago. It's time to look at it again and say, what do we have to do to get it back to the way we want it? Or what other information do we have now that we need to add to the puzzle, so to speak? Yeah. Can I do something to tweak this that I learned from from new information? Maybe I haven't thought about inflation or maybe like a lot of investors that only been in the market for 10 years. Maybe I'm not prepared for <laughs> for this inevitable drop that at some point is coming, OG. Like I don't have a plan for this drop. And people that have only been invested for 10 years have never felt what you and I felt and where my hair went, you know, when uh, when the market dropped out the last couple of times. Well, and to be fair, I mean, during COVID, we all experienced a 30% decline, but it was so quick on the, on the other side of it that from an economic standpoint, obviously, we're still dealing with the effects of COVID, but the financial impacts for most people in their portfolios went down and back. You know, it was pretty quick contrasted to you know, 2007, eight, nine, where we started going down in October of 2007 and hit the bottom in March of 09. You know, that just drip, 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 you know, like a death by a thousand paper cuts. And then of course, in the fall of 08 was, was, uh, in particular, you know, that six month window was pretty bad. Well, that so, was the same thing, 2000 to 2002. I mean, that was a long time ago now, but remember that it was yeah. just this daily 50 to hundred point drop. It was just yep. every yep. stinking day. And then when things started looking good, then we had 9-11 and, it, you know. Bam. And then it's also interesting when you look at the subsequent time period thereafter. So you go, okay, it was from 2000, 2003, the market recovered. What was the recovery like on the backside of that? You still had this great malaise. Yeah, it was pretty flat. I mean, we were talking about it like the lost decade. Remember those that yes. terminology? These people that think now that the S&P 500 is just the marvelous place to be. And the only thing that you should be in, you had a decade there where you did nothing. Yeah. Take a look at those quilt charts. Every year that goes by that US tech companies kick everyone's butt just reinforces more and more of the other side of the equation. I can't see how a logical investor would look at that and say anything other than <laughs> another year. That must mean that to uh, James's point here in, in his article, he's like, I would have thought that value stocks would have done better. You know, nope, large tech growth again. So how many years are we going to do this before the pendulum swings back the other way? You could say the same thing about large companies versus small companies, you know, or US-based ones and non-US-based ones. So don't be discouraged. If you're looking at your investment portfolio and you actually did the thing by being diversified and you've got... S&P and small companies and international and emerging market. And you're like, dang, I was only up 15%. I should have been all US tech. And I would have been up 28. It's like, no, that's the trade that you're making. You're making the trade of not having to say you're sorry. You know, it's, it's, you're going to, you're going to get all of the return of all of the stuff just in a different order. So if patience, if you're a long-term investor though, do you think having a well-diversified tech position you know, maybe the Qs for people who don't know what that is, it's the NASDAQ index. So it's it's heavier into tech or one of the, the tech indices out there. Do you think that's a bad thing? Because with, you know, if I've got a 30 year time frame and we're always going to have new tech and it's kind of self-cleaning, right? Because it's going to always have the top tech companies. It seems like that's a hell of a roller coaster ride to your point. But I don't know. Is it is that bad? Well, I would I would just argue what's the what do you think you're getting by doing that versus not doing it? Oh, good point. You know, I mean, like, what's the premium return you're getting for the the huge roller coaster ride you're going to be on? Well, not even the roller coaster component of it, but just considered in this context. Uh, you know, the S and P last year is up whatever twenty eight percent or something, whatever it finished, and you say, okay, well, what were the drivers of that return? The drivers of that return were large U S tech, so you already participated in it. You know what I mean, like. By being invested in an ETF or an index fund or a mutual fund, you participated in that tech component. And next year, if it's real estate, you're going to participate in it there as well. I don't see that it's terribly necessary to go back, you know, kind of double down, so to speak, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other part about like being specifically 
concentrated in one idea, and what you're talking about here is U.S. tech, is I think the cycle, the timeline that you have to be okay with is longer than you think you have to be okay with it. You know, we were talking about the market decline in 2000. That was also the time when the NASDAQ hit its all-time high, right? In March of 2000, NASDAQ hit 5,000. When was the next time that it hit 5,000? It's a trivia question for Joe. Yeah, I know. So March of 2000 hits a high, obviously went down, and then it came back up. When did it hit 5,000 again on the NASDAQ? Yeah, I'm going to say 2010 or 11. Roughly 2015. Holy cow. uh, Somewhere in the latter part of 2015, November-ish time period. It's a a 15-year time horizon to be technically even money. Now, I know, you know, if you're dollar-cost averaging and all that sort of stuff, like life is good. But that's a really long time to have one singular idea while the rest of the economy does its thing. You know, I mean, 15 years, a decade and a half to be even money. And if you're saying, well, my thesis right now is that tech stocks are where it's at and there's never going to be anything other than tech stocks. It's like, okay, we've had this theory before. Can you wait until... December of 2036 or 2037 to be even money. I mean, you think like how freaking long, I mean, you're already super old, Joe. Oh man. That's like social security age time for you. I mean, you'll be collecting, you'll be on Medicare by the time NASDAQ gets back to even money. So my point is, is like, I think we think I can hold out like, ah, I'm, you know, I'm patient. I can wait it out. But But are you patient enough to, uh, yeah. Are you patient enough to wait out 15 years? I don't know. Well, before we finish this conversation, you know, all of this is wrapped into something that you and I call an investment policy statement. Give everybody an idea of what what are some of the basics that we need to put into this statement? What does it kind of look like? I think the first thing that you want to start with is what is what you're trying to do. Once you decide what you're trying to do with the money, that starts to make the decisions of what you put in it a lot easier. If this money is for your child's education in 20 years, that's going to have a different investment plan than if the money is for a house down payment in five years. So once you have an idea of what the money is for, now you can start putting timeframes on it. Then you can look at, well, what are the investment tools? Because there's thousands of them. What are the investment tools that match up with the time horizon of the thing that I'm trying to do? And automatically you wipe out 75% of all available choices, right? If you look at the pool of investments or you look at the pool of you know, ETFs at Vanguard or going on Schwab or whatever it is, and you go, I don't know which one to pick. Well, there's only certain ones that are tied to long-term or short-term or whatever the timeframe is. And from there, you want to establish what are the rules going to be as it relates to your investing. When you write it down and you say, I will do these things, I'm going to invest $500 a month into this investment plan for the next 20 years. And by doing that, I expect these results. I will reevaluate these results every two years to decide whether or not I'm on track and to decide whether or not I have to increase or decrease my savings rate to stay on track. What do I do if things don't go my way? The stock market goes down 30% in 11 or 17 trading days like it did in COVID. What do I do at that time? And I think if you write those things out, your, your brain already will have solved the problem. And so God forbid those things, the not so fun things do happen. You've already got a plan on the shelf. That's a great thing to do this time of year. Dive in, everybody. I think that's everybody's homework, right, OG? Dive in, create your your investment policy statement uh, if you don't have one. I think that's a far better way to manage your money than to, you know, spend the year panicking about what do I do under these conditions? If you've already got that written out, then you're just retooling like we talked about and James did here in this piece. Doug doesn't have to retool. He's always a tool. (laughs) Coming up next... Right after Doug, speaking of Doug, there he, but I'm glad he didn't hear that. Uh, No, nothing. No, we were talking about you, but it was, it was all good. Erin Sky Kelly, multiple award-winning and best-selling author. Her book, Get the Hell Out of Debt, uh, was number one across lots of categories on Amazon. She's got a fantastic podcast by the same name. Even more than that, she does something different about getting out of debt than I've ever seen before. And I've read a lot of books about getting out of debt. And we're going to talk about that today. Some of the keys to getting yourself out of debt in 2022. But before Aaron, Doug, I think uh, 
Well, what do you got, man? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. All right, fine. It's it's not just the pink Britney shirt that sunk my money situation. I got to come clean about my real debt issue. I'm still in student loan debt for my expensive alchemy degree from good old Southwest Bahama State Beauty School and Technical Institute. Talk about reverse alchemy. Rather than being able to turn things to gold, I turned a degree into debt. But of course, I'm not alone. How much student debt is there in the U.S. actually? Is it $17.5 billion, $175 billion, or $1.75 trillion? I'll be back with the answer right after I figure out how to fake my own death. Well, of course, with Aaron Sky Kelly here today, we're talking about getting your house in order in 2022, and no better way to do that than, of course, with Navy Federal Credit Union, especially if you made a mess last month. The holidays take a toll on so many people's budgets. Well, you have a friend in Navy Federal that can help you get things cleaned up. First of all, if you need to consolidate your debts and get a low intro APR, they have their platinum credit card. It's the lowest rate card and a great tool to consolidate and pay down debt. Navy Federal also has multiple savings and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals. They offer digital tools and educational resources online to help guide your decisions so you make better ones. With Navy Federal, you can automate your saving. We talk about all the time. It's not about discipline. It's about automation. And the more you automate saving, better off you're going to be. And of course, automate your investing as well to put your money to work for you, even as you sleep. Plus, you can buy fractional shares. So learn more at NavyFederal.org. That's NavyFederal.org. Uh, message and data rates may apply. Savings products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. Hey there, stackers. I'm future Philippines resident and Kool-Aid commercial break redhead, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. According to educationaldata.org, 43.2 million student borrowers are in debt by an average of $39,351 each, and the average public university student borrows $30,030 to get their bachelor's degree. Of course, I'm an above average student, so, you know, I've got twice that much debt. Damn you, College of Witchcraft and Wizardry! I'm not alone, though, and here's the answer to our question. As the student loan debt in the United States grows six times faster than the nation's economy and now totals $1.75 trillion. Did you get it right? Of course you did. So lean in, stackers, because if you want to get your debt right, let's see what Aaron Sky Kelly has to say. And here she is, my new friend. I feel like I've known her forever. Erin Sky Kelly's here. How are you? I feel that way too, Joe. You just have that like that type of personality where you're everybody's friend. I think you do. I think you do. And <laughs> and you are friends with some really cool people. Like you travel yeah. with Tony Robbins. You've been on. You and I had a discussion about our mutual friend Phil Town. You you. I want to start off with this because I had a coach tell me this long, long, long time ago, and I haven't heard it again until your book. You talk about this big difference between urgent and important very early on. And I'd love to start there because I think this is such a great way to start off 2022, right? Let's make 2022 yes. the year of important, not urgent. Talk about yeah. that for a moment. Oh my gosh. I think because I watched so many people when the pandemic initially hit, just run around like chickens without heads. Like it was, there was just madness for a long period of time. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly what's happening with people financially. Most of the time, we just now have sort of a microscope on anything. So it's, it was interesting to me to see how people who are focused on urgent things, like sort of the panic situation, they were panic buying toilet paper. They were stockpiling things that they didn't need. They were like completely unprepared for what mattered. And they were fighting with each other on the internet. That was the other thing that they were doing. Right. People who were focused on what's important, they were really like 
checking in with like, how's grandma doing in that home? Like, do we have the capacity to move her into our place during this pandemic? What is the health protocols our family's going to follow to make sure that, you know, we're eating properly and going for walks and spending time together and doing puzzles or, you know, that kind of a thing. And it was such a microcosm for how sort of we had gotten it wrong for so many years prior to the pandemic. We've been so focused on, you know, get things now, hurry now, but like the sale is running out You're, you know, if you don't act now, we're not going to throw in this free toaster. Like we were just consuming, consuming, consuming. And it showed up in our financial picture because when that pandemic hit, people were hurting financially because they had been so focused always on what was urgent and what felt urgent versus what actually mattered in the big picture. I want to know who was the coach that told you that? years ago. It was, I was working for American Express and it was a gentleman named Chris Klinky, who by the way, was also the reason why I left American Express. He did this thing where he wrote a letter giving two weeks notice and people don't do this, by the way, in our business, they leave at midnight with the client files like Jerry Maguire. And then everybody's calling to try to get the client. He, yeah. he, he instead did this whole thing where he said, I have other mountains to climb, which is another phrase I use all the time. Cause he wasn't kidding, Aaron. He actually went and climbed Everest twice, most of the major peaks around the, the world. And now he runs an adventure travel company. Like he's wow. totally done something different, which is the whole reason I'm talking to you today is because I reached 40 and said, you know what? I like this. I don't love it. I have other mountains, I think. So we got to, we got to go. But he was the guy that was like, if I was chasing urgent, I would always be chasing just the next dollar. And I think this is so important, especially with people getting out of debt, because to your point, if we're chasing the next sale, we're chasing the next thing. You're like, I'll get out of debt later. I have to put this on a credit card because if I don't do this now, I'm going to miss this opportunity. Right? Yes. Which is very effective if you're a business owner, right? Right. Right. Play that up if you've got a business because people get sucked into debt because of it. Right. Right. But terrible, terrible financial decision as a consumer. Yes. Everyone has a low point. And I've heard so many uh, just sad low points and people like things, things really have to change. And you had a low point yourself. You're headed out to meet a client. Tell me that story about where your own journey began. Well, you know, I had been part of the urgent part of society for so long. And I was, I was really young when I started buying real estate. I was a teenager because I sort of decided that I worked in media, but my grandfather gave me this really good advice that was like, listen, one day you're going to be fat and ugly and no man is going to put you on TV. Now this was in the 90s. Wow. Men, wow. Men, I know he, he, he meant it in a kind way, as crazy as that sounds. But back then we had middle-aged white males were running the media. And he was really like, if you leave this up to somebody else's decision, they're just going to choose somebody younger and prettier later. Right. So, so he meant, well, what he meant was don't leave your career in the hands of someone else. So I started buying real estate really young, but I really didn't understand fully what an asset versus a liability was. And so I had all of these in air quotes assets, but they weren't necessarily producing cash flow. And I was really doing that leveraging thing where I was just leveraged way too high for the amount of cash that was coming in. And I got to this point where like, I couldn't figure out how did I have all this money like on paper, but why was I so broke? And I hit this point where like, I had no groceries in the cupboard, like no means to kind of get around. And I went to go meet somebody to do a deal. And I started my car and I had no gas in it. And I was like, I can't even go across town to do a deal in order to make, like, I am so broke and I have no room on any card or line of credit or anything. At that point was when I decided to really take a hard look at like what was actually happening and added up all my liabilities and really started to change my relationship with money. Essentially. You're so graphic about it in the book. You talk about how you, you were even making up excuses about why you were going to drink water because you just needed to hydrate more. And you had like, you thought enough money on a gift card that you could buy them a drink and you made sure it was at a time that it wasn't lunch. Like you had this whole story. Because I was, that's what happens when you try and keep up with the Joneses, right? You're wearing this mask and you're lying to not only yourself, but everybody else. I couldn't look broke because I wasn't in a position, you know, I had all this property. I had all of the, you know, I had these means. So I was like trying to figure out how was I going to like buy this person a coffee even like I can't, I definitely can't take them for lunch. It just sort of all started to happen so fast. And I remember like being like, now I have to lie to get out of this meeting because I'm so embarrassed about my financial situation. So I pretended I had diarrhea because I was like, <laughs> for some I, reason that seemed less embarrassing than being like, I can't, I don't have any gas in my car. I feel, I feel bad saying this, that I laugh so hard because I should not be laughing. I'm like, this is so mean, but the fact that diarrhea, and by the way, just the fact that you go, okay, I've got 50 million excuses and diarrhea is the one you went with. 
listen, nobody's going to argue with diarrhea, right? They don't even want you to show up if you've got diarrhea. So that was the moment where I was like, wow, now I'm lying and I can't, I just can't live this way anymore. And so that was the sort of turning point. It wasn't an easy, like, I'd love to say, oh, I just quickly turned the ship around and missed the iceberg, but that's not what happened. Like I still had to hit the iceberg and deal with a few casualties along the way. But isn't that um, the case though, with so many people, you got to talk to a ton of people in your community. It's the way it always happens. You have to hit the iceberg. Yes. And that was mine. I was excited, Aaron, that you also began not just with your own story, which I know for a lot of people is hard to tell. I mean, not just diarrhea, but but just the struggle that you had at the time and that you felt so broke and so alone. Like I felt like I was there in that moment. But you also started as a get out of debt expert, not with the things you should do, but with the things we're not going to do. There were two things. Number one, we will not consolidate debt. Why don't you begin where every commercial on television begins with, hey, Aaron, let's just consolidate this and take care of it. You know, the thing about being in the financial industry for so long, I was a licensed mortgage broker, owned my own mortgage brokerage for a long period of time. And I can tell you throughout the decades of doing that work that I have never once ever, and Listen, if you are the rare exception, I want to hear from you because you're a unicorn, but I have never once heard from anybody who did that and was better off financially. Hmm. So we know it doesn't work because what happens when you really get into numbers and understanding numbers and you do your network spreadsheet and you look at, okay, I've got, you know, $30,000 in debt made up of these, you know, six or seven cards, let's say, and I'm going to consolidate that into one loan. And I put it on my network spreadsheet. You're no different than you were before. You're in the exact same position, except now your interest is compounded differently or it's amortized over a longer period of time. So even though it might feel like you're paying less, you're actually paying more because the part that we keep forgetting is these businesses are not in it to consolidate our debt for us as a favor. They're in it to make money. So it has to be profitable for them. And so the more you keep thinking that the consolidation is going to be the answer, the more you're just diluting yourself or or missing the point of how money actually works. Mm. And instead, if you can understand like, listen, this is, this is a mindset thing. This is like, absolutely. There's a little bit of math involved, of course, but the behavior part is the part that you have to master, not the consolidation part. When you can get that part under control, then it doesn't matter if you have seven credit cards or 17 credit cards or one. You're going to be able to start to handle money and and pay things down in a way that's actually to benefit of you and not a consolidation company. You talk a lot about behavior, but what's the most important like mindset shift to getting yourself out of debt? What's the like one guiding principle maybe that you have when somebody starts off on this journey? Oh my gosh. Okay. So the tricky part about that is I think first you have to really just believe that you can, because we've just been set up or conditioned to really believe that debt is normal. It's here to stay. You know, you have to have it in order to have good credit. And we're, we're playing that credit system, you know, like as if it's the thing that makes us like, we're all hunting for that really great credit score. So we can feel good about ourselves. We forget that that credit score is a moving, breathing number that doesn't stay static. And it's based on just sort of what we've, how we've behaved in the past, not how smart we are. And so people often think like, oh gosh, I just have so much debt. I have so much debt. I have to go to an expert or I have to go to the bank or I have to go you know, outside of myself to figure out how to manage it. And if instead you can just understand, I don't know if you can tell this, Joe, but I'm kind of an idiot. Like I'm only medium smart and I figured it out. And so it's like, you can figure it out. Like it's not, it's it, sometimes the financial industry makes it complicated and it makes it complicated so that then you're reliant on the financial experts in the industry to then sell you things. When in actuality, when you understand money, not only just how money works, but how you interact with money, because how you interact with money, Joe, is going to be different than how I do it. It's going to be different how, than how Ramit does it, than how Dave does it. It's going to be different than how anybody out there does it. So you have to really understand the Dave, the Dave, the in, the all, in, the all Dave. Caps, in all the caps, in all caps, yeah. yeah. It's going to be like, you have to understand not only how it works, but how you interface with it. And then when you can master that part, that's really where it starts to really work in your favor. Second thing you say that you will not do, you won't be cashing in investments to pay down your debt. Oh my gosh. I did this so many times. Like I, (laughs) if you tell me not to touch the hot stove, I'm going to touch it anyway. Cause I'm going to be like, really? Like, let me, let me see for myself. Like I'll just bang my head against the wall until I'm tired of it. Oh, wow. That is hot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I fell into the cycle for a long period of time and then noticed it with a lot of clients and friends and stuff too, where if you get into that cycle where you're you know, using investments to pay off debt. I understand the math behind it because sometimes people will look at something and say, you know, this is only earning me 8%, but my credit card is costing me 19%, but it's 
we're not looking at how that interest is compounded. So we're not actually looking at apples to apples there. We're not comparing the same thing. And when you get in that habit of like paying stuff off in one fell swoop, you're missing out on those money muscles that it takes to get out of debt in the first place, but then also to build those investment muscles, which you really need for the long term. And as it turns out, they're the same muscles. So what I have everybody do is just for, if I'm open to being wrong, maybe there's one person out there that can do this and make this work. I've not seen it in all of my years with the thousands of people I've interfaced with, but if you cannot touch those investments and you do the work of getting the hell out of debt within, you know, 12 to 18 months, and I'm wrong, then go ahead and take the money out and pay it off. But in the meantime, just leave it alone, let it compound, let it do its thing over there, the investments. Let's work on the finer details of the debt and the money over here in the cash flow situation. And then if you get out of debt, now we can just continue to build on what you've already built with those investments. And so I've seen that time and time again. And I did a you know recent podcast with a gal named Leanne who paid off over $100,000 in consumer debt. Wow. She had this massive investment because she worked for a company that did investment matching and stuff like that for yeah. her. And I said to her, please, 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 please. I was like practically begging her, do not, please don't cash it out. She's like, yes, but I could be debt free next week. I'm like, no, 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 please. It's worth it, worth it, worth it. And she's on her way to being a millionaire within a very short period of time because she mastered that money. She's now maxed out all of her investment contributions year after year. And now she's doing other types of investing because she did not touch it. She built those money muscles and now she's using those same money muscles to build those investments even further. I love that. She gets done with, well, yeah, she gets done with one, Erin, and she's got just a ton of momentum already. Yes. Yes. It feels so good when you finish paying off that debt and you're not at zero. Yeah. Positive net worth. You have three phases. We're really in a lot of ways talking through phase one, which is getting Mm -hmm. yourself in the right spot. But just briefly, the three phases of getting your debt paid off, what are those? Well, the phase one is basically just that's the financial fundamentals and really understanding how money works and how you work with money. Phase two is actually paying off the debt. I don't care how you do it. I give you, you know, there's four different kind of systems in the world that are popular and I let you choose for you which one's best for you. But phase two is really where you're actively paying down your consumer debt. And phase three is then when you take everything you learn in phase one and two and you use those same techniques to then build wealth. And phase like three- Like she did, like that woman yeah. did, yeah. Like Leanne, yeah. You're in phase three technically for the rest of your life. And just like- how how you chose to pay off debt, how you choose to invest will be up to your own interests and your personality. And, but at least you'll have a strong understanding of how money and compounding work. Yeah. It's, it's so powerful because the problem isn't the strategy. And I love that you have all kinds of different uh, ways for people to handle debt. The problem is you blow yourself up. And so Mm -hmm. I love that you spend so much time making sure that you're actually ready to do this journey ahead of time. Cause it gets so frustrating seeing people just get partway into their strategy you've seen this, they're great for three or four months. And then they go, man, we, we reached our first milestone. Let's go celebrate with a big screen TV. (laughs) And then we get right back into debt and we do it again. Yeah. It's like the same with those, like whatever those diets were, you know, where you had to like eat the grapefruit and the (laughs) cayenne pepper lemon water for three months. Like you can't sustain that for a long period of time. And it's funny. We'll have diarrhea. (laughs) (laughs) And it's funny that you say that because Angelo Poli, who our listeners know very well from MetPro, who's on quite a bit talking about healthy living, also talks about the grapefruit diet or whatever it is. Your body also doesn't respond to it after a while. And I think it's the same thing with debt plan. Your body goes, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not believing this anymore. All right. You've got 10 keys when you're first getting started. And I think this is great for our debt payoff week and our, hey, let's hit the ground running week. So I'm going to say these 10 and -hmm. you give me the first thing that comes up. Your very first thought from your 10 in the book. Number one, pretend you know nothing. Oh gosh. If you think to yourself, I know that, you're judging yourself and you're blocking off any future learning. And one of the things that I've learned from people like Tony Robbins or people out there who are out there killing in life, they take notes all the time, even if they know something or they're hearing it differently, try and figure out not, do I know this already, but what can I learn from this? It'll change everything financially. I love that. The growth mentality there. Second is no shooting. Oh, that is the biggest swear word. It's so full of judgment. Oh, I hate that word. You know, I say a lot of really, I'm from a small town. I have a very horrible mouth. But the word that I hate the most is should, because as soon as you should on somebody, you know, you tell somebody, oh, you should do this, or maybe you should downsize, or maybe you should, it's laced with judgment and it puts you in a different position from somebody else. And it doesn't really allow them to fully explore what it is they need to do. So instead, if you do have something that you want to share with somebody financially, what might work is if you say, here's what worked in my experience and you share from that perspective, that also will really help you learn and grow. 
you know, I think when you were upstairs, I hope you told mom that no more should like Joe and OG Don't should get out of my me. basement. Do, do not shit on us, please. <laughs> right. No, we belong here. Uh, number three, feel your feelings fully. Oftentimes the drivers behind our financial behaviors are how we feel about things. When we're in our logical part of our brain, we're like, oh yes, of course I'm going to budget. Of course. But then, you know, it's like middle of the month, you're tired. You don't feel like cooking, right? You make an emotional decision. So I think it's important to feel those feelings rather than cut them off and accept that they're going to happen, but then act in spite of how you feel. Which by the way, is the next, is the next one. <laughs> Do not let emotions dictate your behavior. You know what? I was so lucky. I grew up with all brothers because, you know, when I was a teenager and, and PMS hit, I feel like we're getting really into analysis TMI. But like, I noticed that they weren't crazy once a month, right? Like they seem to like be pretty level-headed all the time. And so I, I quickly learned I'm letting my emotions run the show here and that's not healthy for me or anybody I'm around. And so I learned how to really master, understand how to manage in spite of how you feel. Yeah. I've, I've heard so many times, well, personal finance is personal and I feel better doing this. And while I do agree that personal finance is personal, I still sometimes hear and go, no, no, it still is. That's a bad course. That's not going to be good. There are some basics. There are some yeah. basics that you have to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Next up is approach everything with grace. Mm -hmm. You got to be really kind to yourself. Oh, I thought you meant, I'm like, I got to get a friend named Grace. I don't <laughs> Grace. know Grace. Grace is amazing. She's a multimillionaire. We <laughs> just approach everything with her. She'll Fantastic. We're so hard on ourselves, right? Especially when we screw up and we are going to screw up. Like I now think of myself as pretty darn smart with money. And when the pandemic hit, I started ordering my groceries. I accidentally ordered a case of honey instead of a jar of honey. And so like, you're still going to make mistakes. I just gave it to all my neighbors. And I'm like, well, how can I make this into a good thing? I was right? going to so say, now I know what I'm getting for the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> if I get, if I get honey from my friend, Aaron. That's right. Now you'll know why. <laughs> I get four, four things of honey. Uh, next up is be willing to get uncomfortable. Yeah. I will let you know this, right. You've had to do it too. Whenever you are going to make a change or you're going to like go after a really big goal, like you want to be debt free for life and live debt free and start to build wealth. Like it's going to require you to be uncomfortable because even though how you're living now might be stressful, you're used to it. Yeah. So sometimes being uncomfortable is being used to being a, you know, somebody who makes great money decisions. I love that advice. And as you know, from having been through your whole journey, it's so, so hard, mm -hmm. which is the next one. Stay in your lane. Oh man. You know, I see parents do this with grown children, even still where somebody's going to make a financial decision and then somebody just swerves right out of their lane and, and tells them what to do. And you really have to let people make mistakes. I think it's really critical also to teach children from a young age about money and let them make money mistakes when they are living under your roof. If we don't allow children to manage money or, you know, be trustworthy with money when they're young, then they are going to make those mistakes in their twenties and thirties. And it's so much more difficult to overcome when they're older. So really staying in your own lane is about like, focus on your own finances before you worry about how somebody else is spending or how somebody else is managing and set goals based on you and where you're at and really put the blinders on and don't concern yourself with how other people are doing. It's so disappointing. It's so much more fun to just complain about other people on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any problems. I want to, I want to complain about everybody else's, some strangers problems. It's true. What you resist persists. Oh man. that's Carl Jung that said that. Okay. So this is what I've learned is sometimes like if you're chasing money, like if you're going after something really hard and it's not working, you have to pull back and let go because sometimes I don't know what the right word is. I'm not very woo woo, but like, it's a little bit like the universe is trying to put you in a different direction, right? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. when something feels really hard and it's not going the way you want it to go, it's a clear sign that you need to back off and allow things to shift. It's like dating, right? If you're interested in somebody and you pursue them with that state of desperation, they're going to run like money is going to run from you. <laughs> Whereas if instead you focus on you and you stay healthy and happy, you can attract money. You can attract the things that you want. And so sometimes resisting things is just going to cause that problem to stay longer instead of surrendering or finding a solution around it, which is the easier way to go. It is so true. The last two on these, by the way, are in, and this is my opinion, are the two most powerful and I think that this next one, Aaron, is any success that I've had in life, a lot of it's just attributed to this. And you say just two words, show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think <laughs> with finance, now this is a little bit of me in the story, but I grew up believing, this is so embarrassing to admit to you. We've, we've already been there. We've like already been so there. <laughs> I really believe that like I was going to marry somebody who was going to take care of me. 
I believed it was like, everything would be fine as long as I could be rescued. So there was always a part of me that thought somebody else was going to rescue me. The bank would step in and I'd be able to consolidate, or I would get a better job or something outside of me would help rescue me from my financial issues. It wasn't showing up for me when I believed that something external was going to save me. And instead, when I showed up, even when it was hard, even when it was difficult, even when it was embarrassing, you know, having hard conversations or doing the difficult thing was the thing that I needed to do in order for things to then become easy. And so showing up, even when you don't feel like it is absolutely critical. It's like people who, you know, they sign up for a course, let's say, or they, you know, they start and they they do the first couple lessons, then it gets hard and they make excuses, right? Like, I'm going to take yoga. And then the fourth yoga lesson, they start dropping out and then they quit. Just showing up. I feel like you're looking at me when you say that. Are you looking at me? Are you staring at me? On the floor in the hot yoga studio and cried. Okay. (laughs) It's fine. It's safe. (laughs) But like just going sometimes is the thing that you need to break the pattern. Yes. So showing up is absolutely critical. Yes. So much success when you're just in the room, even if it's virtually, if you're in the room. Yes. And the last one, I think the one that especially people who are uber successful for short periods of time forget, maintain an impeccable standard of self-care. Oh my goodness. I think, again, that helps with the emotional part we were talking about earlier. When you are rested, when you're well-fed, when you've taken care of some of the basics, like we, f- we forget that budgeting and doing your net worth is self-care. That's a form of self-care. So when you're doing that consistently, then what happens is you're able to perform at a higher level. When you're hangry, for example, you're making maybe decisions that aren't healthy for anybody. Like you're, you're snapping at people that you love, you're creating drama, you're part of something that's, that's not whole and healthy. And so having an impeccable standard of self-care, whatever that means for you, everybody's got something different, right? I I have a whole chapter on this in the book that is different than how most people describe self-care. Self-care for me is not, you know, about the ice cream or uh, even about resting. It's about what is the thing that I need to do to get myself to the next place that I want to be so that I can feel proud of myself when I fall asleep. And usually it's not some big thing. Usually it's just a very tiny thing done consistently. But maintaining that level for yourself, like making that the priority over everything else is the thing that anchors you back to what's important in life. And it helps you avoid all of those urgent things that go off because you'll realize that, oh, this is just the next siren. This is just the next news cycle. This is just the next clickbait. And I'm not going to be a part of it. I want to dive into a couple of tactics before we go. And I think, by the way, stackers, that the fact that we're talking about tactics this late in this discussion shows you how important this mindset is and how much we forget that and why we we lose because I think of all the things, Aaron, you said earlier, not because we don't have the right tactic. And don't get me wrong, tactics are important and sticking with your game plan is important, but you're not going to stick with it if you don't do the things that we already talked about. Net worth and budgeting. Number one, why net worth before the budget? Why not budget? Because oh doesn't gosh. budget lead to net worth? Like, why do you have them in that that order? First of all, budgets suck. Let's just admit that everybody hates them. We all hate them. They suck. So if you start with that, you're setting yourself up for like that big old depression, like, oh, this is never going to work. But if you start with net worth, you can actually figure out where it is you are. The net worth really is the, is the guidepost that tells you like what is actually happening. It's like the truth slayer. This is what it looks like now. But the only job of the budget is to increase the net worth. We don't know what it's supposed to do if we don't have a record of the net worth first. And the other thing that's really critical about a budget that I think nobody talks about is that nobody in the history of ever has ever gotten a budget perfectly. Like, have you ever budgeted and it started the month and then it turned out exactly as you planned at the end of the month? No. No, and no. we never talk about that. Yeah. We never talk about that. And I finally figured out, gosh, if I even get it right 80% of the time, I am killing it financially. But if I don't have a budget, if I don't have a goalpost to even kick at to begin with, I'm not going to get there. And so understanding that this budget that you're going to make isn't going to be perfect, but its entire job is just to increase the net worth, whether that means paying down liabilities if you've got debt or increasing and in purchasing assets if you're if you're building wealth. If, if we just understand that all you have to do with that budget is figure out how to make that happen, just squeeze out a couple of things to either pay down that debt or increase that net worth, then you're laughing. So then it's not about the budget being perfect ever. And it's not about an app or it's not about, the, although there are some great apps out there. It's not about any of that. It just becomes about that, you know, increasing that net worth to really get you that you know, sort of financial wholeness or financial freedom that you're looking for. I think a very important thing that you discuss is it's important to stick with it, right? To stick with Mm -hmm. the budget. And as you know, it gets so difficult to do that, Aaron. And you have another hilarious story about dating a guy who's a 10. Well, it sounds like he's like a 12 on the one to 10 meter for you. 
And His name so, was Corey Horton. This was a fan. I can still smell him when you when we talk about him. I can remember what he smells like. Wait a minute, Corey Horton. Did he smell like donuts? Is he like Tim's kid? <laughs> is that is that what he is? No. No, he smelled like musk and like cheap drugstore cologne. But it was fantastic. I was young, you know. I fell for anything then. Yeah. So tell me how this translates to budgets. Well, you know, I think when you don't have a plan, you make terrible decisions. And so Corey Horton was a guy that like broke my heart. You know, he said he was going to call and he didn't. And, you know, he was like kind of a player and very, very handsome. If I mentioned that enough, I've mentioned that he was like, you know, I don't know if you mentioned that a lot at all. You can get away with a lot when you're handsome. And what I realized soon is I had to have a plan for when I would run into Corey Horton because otherwise I'd make the worst decisions. And so the budget is a lot like, you know, making a plan to avoid your Corey Hortons. The budget is the thing that like, no matter how you're feeling or no matter if you're smelling his sweatshirt at three o'clock in the morning while he's out with another woman, you know what I mean? Like you're going to make the right decisions for your money. You're not going to fall into the trap. And so it's really critical that you understand that the budget is basically just a boundary. It's saying, Hey, here's my financial goal. Whether that be like, you know, you want to max out your 401k or your, you know, whatever, take your family to Disney world for the week, whatever the financial goal is, the budget is just the boundary for that. So it doesn't have to be strict or firm. It just has to be the thing that protects you from the Corey Horton decision you're about to make. Yeah. Mine is the Tim Horton decision. Yes. the Tim Horton. That's that's mine. And that's not good self-care either, but it, but it tastes good. good Sometimes, sometimes eating my feelings is (laughs) feels great in the moment. And by the way, you said that, you know, Corey, Horton would also sometimes lead to something called a frozen Chicago, which also doesn't sound like that was good either. I mean, it was great in the moment, but not good. That's right. Frozen Chicago is a blender drink. They used to sell it at Jack Astor's. I don't know if it still exists, but it was like some crazy combination of ice cream, Kahlua or something. It was amazing. And it was terrible to say, right? But it's again, I didn't have a plan for those things. And so I was always just choosing to make myself feel better over doing the thing that would make me feel good in the long term. You did a podcast recently on planning with others. And and by the way, we will link to this in the show notes because this is super important if you plan with other people. But just a guideline, how is this different if you're planning with someone else? You're talking about like a partner situation? Yes, yeah, like sure. Oh gosh. Okay, well, first and foremost, we never marry somebody who has the same financial you know blueprint as we have, which makes life fun and spicy. But I think it's absolutely critical that you have what's called a naked budget meeting, meaning- you can go ahead and get naked because then both people are probably going to show up to the budget meeting. But most importantly, it's like where you really lay out why you want the things financially that you want. Because when one partner is a spender, one partner is a saver, let's say the saver can really bring a lot of shame on the spender. It's really critical to understand why the saver wants the spender to rein it in. Like if it comes down to like, Hey, I I don't feel safe, you know, that we're going to have a retirement that feels safe to me. Or if it's like, I'm just worried that you're not prioritizing the family or something like that. Those conversations have to be had. And we outline a really great you know, series of questions to have those conversations together. But I think it's really important to understand like your partner is going to be wrong about money 100% of the time and you are going to be wrong to them 100% of the time. So the, the key is to really figure out like where is that common ground and start there. Start with a relationship vision financially together. What are we working for? Why are we spending all this time in our careers and our jobs? What is the point of this at the end of this? And how are we going to work together so that this, and you know, you're talking earlier about shopping and that dopamine hit, you can get that same dopamine hit buying assets as the spender. So there are ways to flip that narrative so that it actually works for you instead of against you, but you have to, you got to talk, you got to figure it out together. And that, that talking to me is the most powerful budget. Like that is the most, because then you, if you have the scheduled talking, then you're going to have these organic conversations, you know, that spring from that. And and that's, that to me is where the magic happens. The book is called Get the Hell Out of Debt, The Proven Three-Step Method That Will Radically Shift Your Relationship to Money. I have never read a book that does such a great job of the mindset, which is why we screw up. And I think especially this first week of January, this mindset is so important. And I'm assuming, Aaron, we can get this everywhere, right? Yeah, it's available everywhere. And uh, I know you've said this elsewhere. You like the small bookstores like we do. So if you can get it there. Yes, I love, please, please support your small independent booksellers because they're, you know, they work extra hard and- you know, for the extra 50 cents, it's going to cost you to buy a book there. You really are putting food on somebody else's table. And I think that that's a really important thing we can do, especially in the month of January. And we're losing these great play. I mean, let's make it more selfish. Yours yours is great, but to make it more selfish, we're losing these places that are the world's best hangouts. They're the best place to go and all that book smell and just hanging out with all these ideas and it's gone. It's going away. Yes. 
and they know, they know the books. Like you can ask them a question. They're not just like, here's where it's located, but they can tell you like the flavors and the spices of the different books that come in. And yeah, genius. I was reading a book called Confessions of a Bookseller, which I highly recommend everybody. It's just a diary one year of this used bookseller in Scotland. And in one of the chapters, he said, a guy came in today and asked where the self-help section was. And one of us got the irony. (laughs) Okay. I got one, I got one more, one more question. And this has nothing to do with anything except I talk to a lot of authors. I see a lot of covers. Mm -hmm. There is a bicycle on the front cover. Yes. Why, why is there a bicycle on the front cover of your book? Oh gosh. Okay. So I'm known for saying things that are a little outrageous, not on purpose. I just like, I, I don't really have a filter that's working properly. And this one time I was speaking at this conference and I, I came out of the gate, we were talking about, you know, budgeting and net worth and, and somebody raised their hand and said, I fail at it every time. And I, so I just keep quitting. And I said, okay, well, how many of you in the room learned to ride a bike? How many of you know how to ride a bike? And everybody raised their hand. I said, how many of you were really good at it the first time? And then like, you know, nobody raised their hand. I said, that's like me. Like the very first time I rode a bike, I like hit the curb and banged my crotch and fell over the, you know, and skinned my knee. And then I said, so budgeting and network, that's like, we're going to have to bang our crotches a few times before we get this right. And then like, I heard it for the first time and everybody else, you know what I mean? I was like, oh no, I could feel my face go red. Like my, my hands were red. Every part of me was embarrassed. It just came up. So now there's a bike on the cover. <laughs> Hey, this is Jen Pilcher, Navy spouse of 23 years. And when I'm not helping military spouses connect in our digital community, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Erin Sky Kelly. And I absolutely love the fact, OG, that she spends a lot of time on all the prep work to getting out of debt. Like it's, what's that? uh, There's a great quote somebody had a long time ago about meetings that if you double the amount of time that you prep for meetings, you can shorten the meetings by a lot, you know? And I think it's the same thing with getting out of debt. If you focus a lot on the why and the how and setting up the system that works right for you and the mindset, you get all that together first and you're going to do a lot less flailing. Well, the mindset's probably the most important component, right? You, You know, once you decide... You have to be the one that says, I'm ready to do this and I'm, and I'm willing to do what it takes to make this happen. And once you do that, then you're off to the races. So have the mindset right, develop the plan, stick to it. Hey, let's roll out Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Getting out of debt, getting back into debt, and then getting back out of debt. <laughs> That's my favorite. We I this. like getting out of debt so much that I just keep doing it. <laughs> it is, our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put your loved ones and your time before anything else, which is fantastic. But having them time with your loved ones while you're out of debt, even better. That's why they made buying term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life, you'll get a free quote. Affordable prices, all policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 year old insurer. Today, we're going to throw the Haven Lifeline out to Ramon. Say hi, Ramon. Hey, Joe and OG. The last t shirt I got from you guys is starting to become a little faded, so I figured I'd call in and see if I can score me another one. So, here we go. I wanted to see if you guys can touch on infinity banking. Now, OG. We've been told you don't prep for the show, so I figured I'd give you a little backstory here. (laughs) Apparently, this is just when an individual takes out a whole life policy and then takes loan against that policy in order to fund their lifestyle. Apparently, the big draw is that the money keeps working, even though by you taking a loan out, the money still is still, quote unquote, working or invested. And therefore, you maximize your gains. I'm not sure if there's more to the story than that. But I figured I'd see if you guys can kind of put your spin on it. Really looking forward to getting a sweet code in the mail for a new T-shirt. It's about time. Thanks, guys. See you. Hey, thanks, Ramon. And, and and by the way, even though he does show up cold for the show, he is deep body of knowledge on how life insurance policies work. So uh, infinite banking, nothing new to you and I, OG. What are your thoughts about infinite bacon? And by, by the way, I love Ramon that you call up whenever it's time to, to upgrade the wardrobe because a lot of sweet t-shirts out there, but uh, another Haven life, greatest money show on earth code coming your way for that great question. Infinite banking. 
infinite ways for other people to earn commission on you. Is that what that means? He, he left that part out. The, it's the infinite way for someone to rob you blind of your money in little increments. Yeah, see, when, I don't, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, cool. I actually, well, I actually think infinite baking can work really well. Yeah, no. Okay, so let's talk about it. Anytime that you use a tool that is not designed for its use, there's going to be some inefficiencies there. So you say like, oh, you can use your whole life policy so you can pay your electric bill. Okay, there's something that's not right about that statement. If you just take it for what it's worth, which is to say, do I need to buy life insurance and dump a whole bunch of cash into it so that I can then take loans on my cash so that my I can live my life? Like... The, you're just putting in lots and lots of restrictions along the way. You see this also with like home equity lines of credit, right? I actually did. You and I talked about this that I was like, I might do this just to see how screwed up it is. I think I this is great out. too. I think this is also great. I couldn't figure out like how many, I have enough moving parts in my life. I didn't need to have like, and then I take a line of credit, but I got to call the bank and then the, and then the mortgage is due and I pay it all back. And then it's like, oh my God, just put it in my savings account. It'd be easier. Yes. So Philosophically, this is a great place to start, I think. Anytime that you're being pitched something that involves a tool that is not designed for that particular thing, you have to ask a lot more questions. You know, like, why in the heck do I need life insurance to, like, create a savings account? That doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, no, but the savings account pays you back. Like, that's what my savings account does. I don't need to have a life insurance policy to do that. What's in it for you, insurance sales person who's trying to talk me into this? Oh, that's right. A commission. And again, not that commissions or insurance salespeople shouldn't get commissions. I don't have, I think it's fine. Like how you get paid is how you get paid, but you should need whole life insurance for the purposes that whole life insurance provide, which is life insurance for your lifetime and, you know, a death benefit that you're going to have when you're 110 years old, not because it can provide a cash free withdrawal or tax free withdrawal if you need to you know, put food on the table in 10 years from now. Ramon, I'm going to be a little more positive about this. I think infinite banking and without getting into all the strings that get pulled or, you know, uh, different people call the mortgage thing that the OG is talking about mortgage shredding, mortgage acceleration. I think these plans both can work incredibly well. And when you do the math on how they work, you can't dispute the math. That is not where I have a problem with it, OG, because I, like you, have a problem with it. The problem is... Both of these strategies work really well until they don't. And the one thing that makes both of these strategies run really, really well is free cash flow. Because as long as you continually have the free cash flow to make the strategy work, it works great. But the second that your cash flow goes to hell, in infinite banking, to your point, OG, the second your cash flow goes to hell, all of a sudden now, you're paying more and more and more money for insurance. And as you know, that's going to multiply because the amount of outstanding coverage that the company is going to have to insure versus the amount that you are supposedly insuring, right? That number just keeps going up and up and up. So your costs go from almost nothing, if you're doing it right, to a monstrosity that is very, very difficult to get the wheels back on the bus. And mortgage shredding, if you run out of cash flow, now you've got a mortgage and a home equity loan. You now have both. You now have more debt and uh, two payments. And you now have this thing that because you don't have cash flow, uh oh, now you're more likely to lose your house because you don't have cash flow than you did beforehand. The downside is far, far greater than the downside is if you just do it the straightforward way. And that's not to dispute anything you said. I totally agree that somebody is telling you, hey, use life insurance as a savings account. You got to go, well, huh, 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 what? Yeah. It's ugly. It's inefficient. I would argue that there's probably some BS math in there, but your point is probably the easiest one, which is all of it works until it stops working. And when it stops working, it stops working in a hurry and it gets ugly fast. I would think about it from the concept of like, what are you trying to do? If you're do using it for the, the, you know, the line of credit, the home equity thing, I want to pay my house off faster, then pay your house off faster. Like you don't need to like go get another loan to pay your house. Like, but it'll save me six extra months of interest. Okay, just go get a little side hustle and go pay that extra. You know, don't go out to eat for six months and like save that. You know what I mean? Like, figure out what it is you actually think that you're getting from it, 
and see if there's another way to do that. You know what I mean? It's like um, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day about um, a 0% balance transfer on a credit card, right? Or like, oh, I got this 0% offer. You know, I got this credit card. I should do it. And I'm like, well, what's the fee? Oh, there's no fee. I'm like, there's a fee. <laughs> there has to be a fee. I always like, love that. There is no yeah. fee. No, there's no. Yeah, there's fee. Well, it's 3%. Okay. All right. So it's a $10,000 balance. You know, right now you're paying 15% interest. It's a 0% deal. So you go 15 to zero. Sounds like a really good deal. How long is the 0% good for? It's good until May. Okay. So now you got five months of 0%, which is better than paying 15% for, but you're paying three to get it. So that's $300. You would have paid uh, $125 a month for the next five months worth of interest if you paid zero. Right, so you've got seven hundred dollars of interest going in. You're paying three hundred dollars to not have it, you know. So now, now you're going. Well, my benefit is four hundred dollars. That's not zero. It's something. I agree with that completely. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on to save you four hundred bucks. And my question would be: Is there an easier way for you to just go make four hundred dollars? Do you got some crap in the closet that you can throw on eBay and make four hundred bucks? Probably. Anyways, okay. Well. Get off. Let me let me let me slide this soapbox <laughs> off to the side. I'm gonna step down from it. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, mom's friend Gertrude gonna send a code to Ramon for being brave and asking another question. Gonna help him upgrade his wardrobe, OG. Stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail if you've got a question for OG and I. That's gonna do it for today. Hey, we've got a fantastic show on Friday. Guess what's happening on Friday, OG? <sighs> I think I know this already, but what is it? Our friend Len Penzo is bringing in. Oh, the uh, eight ball. Magic eight ball. We're going to look into. Which is a different thing than what he remembers an eight ball being. <laughs> Whole different story. That's coming up on Friday and uh, going to make you say fry yay coming up. Your hair look good? I'm you looking. Good? You getting it? I'm looking pretty sweet. I got to be honest. <laughs> Seriously. You're checking your hair while I'm finishing out the show. Look at that. Hey. All right. Just the uh, right amount of. Right amount of silver on the side. Got the nice little... Oh, boy. What do Big you think th- about the, the little goatee? My kid my kid said they have a goatee. Big thanks to everybody for hanging out with us. And if you're somebody who needs to think bigger in 2022 than you did in 2021, guess what? OG and his team are taking new clients. So at Come on down. You're dot the next com contestant. Slash OG. And that is his team's calendar. And the first step in doing better, me do better in 2022. All right, Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, budgets? The method doesn't matter as much as the fact that you're doing one and that you're focused on the end zone with that debt. With a clear goal and singular focus, you can pay your debt off in no time. Second, infinite banking? It's fantastic! Until it isn't. While the concept is sound as long as things go well, buyer beware. But the big lesson? Don't send hate mail about my clothing choices, people. I will give you this, though. Freeing Brittany over my debt doesn't make sense if I'm now a debt prisoner. The lesson is this. If you can't afford to buy a politically charged and sparkly crop top with cash, you can't afford it at all. Thanks to Erin Sky Kelly for being here with us. You can find more about her at erinskykelly.com, and that's Sky with an E on the end, like everybody spells it. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2021, and is created by Joe Salcihat. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Know how I know how brilliant Paulette is? She wrote the words I'm reading right now. While she's not putting awesome words in my mouth, she helps writers power their work and businesses power their words. See how she can help you at thatwriterpaulette.com. After you listen to our show, check out our show notes page and the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 401 about all things money at the 201, our newsletter, at stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we get all of this goodness bottled up, 
It goes over to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart, who helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to talk about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and room mother in our Facebook group, The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. She and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, reminding you that cupcakes, yeah, they're just muffins that believed in miracles. So anything is possible. All right, you uh, you watching the new Boba Fett? No, I heard it's terrible. Is it terrible? I haven't started. Don't tell me that. I mean, it's not terrible. It's probably awesome. <laughs> no, I actually heard. I actually saw two two criteria uh, or two reviews. I should say one one said uh, that it was good, and one said it was crappy. So I don't know, never. man. If it's like I haven't started yet, but if it's like Loki, like Loki was just confusing. Did you watch Loki? No, I didn't watch any of it. Was, it was just confusing. It was, I mean, it was okay, and I finished it. But uh, hey, another one that I just finished, though, in the Marvel superhero universe, I just finished this season of a show called Hawkeye. Can I tell you a secret? I'm working with an Avenger. Can I speak to your manager? Didn't realize you were supposed to bring guns. It's almost Christmas. I can't go home until I fix this. Should we be worried? I'll be home for Christmas. I promise. <sighs> Sorry, Santa. We're out of regular arrows. Oh my God, trick arrows? We're saving the holidays. They even have trick arrows, OG. Stuff blows up, which I know is your criteria for the best movies. Lots of stuff blows up in Hawkeye. Speaking of, how are we not talking about Spider-Man? I have not seen Spider-Man. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Are you like, what's wrong? We got to that. Well, number one is Cheryl had knee surgery. Number two is uh, Autumn, my daughter, is in from Japan. We haven't seen her in two and a half years and uh, spent a lot of time playing some board games. But we did finish Hawkeye during this. And uh, Clint Barton, a.k.a. Hawkeye, teams up with uh, Haley Steinfeld, who in this case plays a, a young woman who is a fan of the Avengers and also very good at archery herself. And uh, throughout this uh, very short series, six shows in this series, she's trying to convince Clint that they need to be working together. And he's like, nope, we're not partners. We are not partners. There are many other familiar faces and some top actors, actresses in this, in this show. Very straightforward show, OG. If you like Marvel and you like the straightforward Marvel stuff, this pulls no punches. It goes exactly down Main Street. It is billed for the holidays, was meant to end, of course, at the end of the year to take you through Thanksgiving to Christmas. And you know what? Does a great job. All set in this holiday universe for six episodes. The side storyline is that Clint, aka Hawkeye, needs to get home for Christmas. And he's got this problem that uh, there's too many bad people that he's got stuff he's got to take care of. So on one hand, he's being pulled by his family to get the heck home and the other can't go home till he takes care of business. 
a few other stories. It's funny. We got halfway through this and I said to Cheryl, you know, none of these happen without a twist. And so looking at all the characters, what's the twist? And we actually figured out the twist by that because we've seen so many of these Marvel shows. They're like, okay, halfway through this, there's got to be a twist. There's no other twist than this one. And Cheryl goes, oh my, you're right. And then the very next episode, we see the same twist that we had predicted. So predictable, but still very fun. I liked it way better than Loki. Didn't like it as well as the Mandalorian. So if you have Disney plus, this is a, this is good, but not great. How about that? Good, but not great. Okay. Good, not great. What are your 2022 business goals? Simplified IT, more security. Dell Technologies has the expertise to help you from transforming your digital workspaces to providing comprehensive end-to-end IT solutions. Get high-performance computers featuring Windows 11 Pro with powerful hardware-based security and savings up to 45% during Dell's New Year event sale. Get special financing through Dell Financial Services. Call a Dell Technologies advisor at 877-ASK-DELL.